Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, just 12 o'clock now. We'd like to welcome all of you to the 2020 AFC Summit webinar series, proudly hosted by Namatuck Resource Associates and the statewide AFC Roundtables. The AFC Roundtables meet regionally and virtually to continue the mission of the AFC Summit to learn, share, and continue the dialogue between AFC organizations. This webinar series is an adaptation of the annual AFC Summit typically held at Holy Cross College, and we thank all of you for staying connected virtually with us. We ask that you also stay tuned for future webinar opportunities. This week's series has reached more than 508 registrants, and we're pleased with the positive response. For today's webinar, you'll have two moderators, myself, Deb Schneer, and Carrie Parity, who will assist with Q&A. A few brief instructions for participants. This webinar is offering nursing contact hours. We ask that each participant sign into the chat feature located on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Following today's webinar, you'll receive an email evaluation with instructions on returning that evaluation. We'll share your feedback with the presenter, but you'll also receive a certificate of contact hours electronically. Cheryl is also willing to share her PowerPoint presentation with attendees. So that will be included in today's email. We ask that all participants remain muted throughout the webinar. Please submit any questions that you have through the chat feature or the hand raise feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And a moderator will read your questions periodically throughout the presentation uh, or Cheryl may uh, choose to unmute you and uh, continue the conversation through that level of engagement. Without further delay, we'd like to introduce today's webinar presenter, Cheryl Chan. She is Nikki's mom and a community leader, leader and change agent. Cheryl, welcome this morning. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This is really exciting and I really appreciate the opportunity. I love that you um, made the switch to go virtual so that we could continue to um, continue the conversation, as you said, and, um, and keep, keep moving and sharing the information that's so critical to all of us. So, um, you know, I'm like I said, I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. This is one of the AFC Summit. I've, I've spoken at every one so far, and it's always been um, an honor and a thrill. Um, I don't know that I've filled the room with as many people as there are here today. I think that's really exciting. I'm a little bit. I, I'm a frequent public speaker. I talk all the time, um, and yet um, I don't know. I'm a little out of practice with this whole pandemic isolation thing. I am not used to uh, doing it. It's funny how you lose some of these skills pretty quickly. So, but I'm back and I am ready to go. Um, as you saw, just for the first few minutes of this, as we were talking, I just pulled this together this morning. And that is not because I'm lazy, because I am. It is only because this is a topic that's, you know, a tough one for me. And so we're going to get through this. Can't guarantee it's not going to be without a little bit of emotion, but you know what? that's always a, go a good thing. It's, it's always an okay thing, right? So um, my, uh, my first caveat to this whole thing is forgive me if this is, this is something that, uh, that is a little rough to get through. I've talked about Nikki's Law many, many times over the last six years, but not at this depth. I've talked about it in the context of you know, the bill and the advocacy piece and moving forward with the legislation and stuff like that. So you know, I kind of got used to speaking about it that way. Today, what I'm sharing with all of you are things that I have never, ever shared before. This is the first time in terms of the details and, and exactly how this all came about. So, yeah, so this is, even though the topic is not new, um, this particular presentation is. So I'm really excited about it. So here we go. Um, if I, I don't mind taking any questions um, during it for, for Carrie and Deb, but um, I, think, I think you're right to say that let's, let's wait till for questions um, at the end so we make sure that we stay on time. Um, and you are welcome to just um, use the chat box because I do have that up. I don't have anybody's screen up. I'm simply looking at my slides. So the only way to catch my attention is to use that chat box. So thank you. All right, so here we go, maybe. All right, 
Now, before I get into too much detail, I want to make sure that you understand that my husband, Alex, and I, right from the very beginning, made the choice to redact a lot of information. Um, the story is about triumph. It's not about pointing fingers. It's not about blaming, calling out people, calling out names, um, uh, you know, including any of, any of the characters that were involved in this whole situation. And that's because it gives them a voice and they don't have the right to have their own voice. Nikki didn't have a voice when he was abused, but he has a voice now, and that's the voice that's going to come full and true throughout all of this. So, you know, and there are other reasons. There are reasons that, you know, include um, the minute we start talking about, you know, names and conjuring them up and, you know, the media is going to find them. Um, we're going to have to talk about those people, and um, it just doesn't serve a purpose, and it brings them back into our life in a way that you know they don't deserve to be brought back so um that's why you'll see throughout this um that we have redacted any mention of the abuser um the witnesses and the agency that was involved um when this all took place which by the way was the day program agency, not the residential agency. A lot of people make that mistake. There's an assumption a lot of times that abuse only takes place within home settings. And that's not at all true. This particular abuse of Nikki took place in a day program setting. So um, that's why we redact. So here's where the story begins. We received a call um, back in June of 2014 from the program agency, the day program where Nikki was, stating that they had filed a report with DPPC because drug paraphernalia had been found on the caregiver that was with him. There was always two people in the community with him. So drug paraphernalia had been found on one of those caregivers um, on a particular day. And so um, they had filed with DPPC, which is a mandate of the program, of the program, of the providing agencies. So they called me as a courtesy just to say, hey, listen, this happened. Um, you may or may not get something in the mail about it, but um, this is a process that we're mandated to do and we're calling to let you know that this happened. We, um, you know, unilaterally made the decision to go ahead and fire this person who was working with Nikki, but there doesn't appear to have been anything any harm done to Nikki. It's just that the, um, the person had drug paraphernalia on them during work while working with Nikki. So, you know, as, as upsetting as that was, we kind of said, okay, well, it sounds like, you know, all of the things were done properly and every did, everyone did what they were supposed to do. So, okay. So um, about, I want to say a couple weeks later or so, um, we received um, a letter a very thick envelope in the mail from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Executive Office of Health and Human Services, DDS. And um, in fact, we received two, two big envelopes in the mail that were identical. And so one of them was this report. And this was our first experience ever um, receiving anything like this in all of our years in you know special education and so on and so forth. So we didn't, we had no idea what this looked like or what to expect. So we opened up the first envelope and we had this cover letter that talked about um, there's, there's been a notification and the senior investigators um, are, there was a notification of a complaint filed specifically as a, I've underlined here, a caretaker was using illegal drugs while in the community with Nicholas Chan. Um, the rest of the uh, letter talks, this cover letter talks about, you know, what this process means. Um, the matter of complaint may be resolved fairly and efficiently within five business days. And once that's complete, here are your rights, here you'll receive an action plan and so on and so forth. So um, that was the first page. The next page um, included um, further information. It talked about um, the investigation and it talks about it gives the numbers and so on and so forth and then under allegation you'll look and you'll see that there's a little bit more information there about exactly what happened. ALAB 
stands for alleged abuser. So the alleged abuser was smoking illegal drugs while in the community with the alleged victim and made numerous stops while out in the community. A pipe was observed in the van. The alleged abuser said, what do you think it is and why do you think I keep going into the restroom? There was no injury and the alleged abuser will be terminated. So that was the that is the extent of all of the information that we had regarding the actual situation. Um, it also says that a case is pending with the um, alleged abuser and alleged victim for abuse per se, and it says that D, the DA has been it, it has been referred to the DA. I'm going to talk in a minute about what all of this stuff means. I'm going to show you what the DPPC process involves so that you'll understand that. But this is this is our story thus far. So um, findings and conclusions. Um, the complaint is being resolved fairly and efficiently. The agency has terminated the alleged abuser on January 16th of 2014 for another incident currently under investigation. This matter is resolved by the expedited re resolution in accordance with the um, CMR. So the law is stated there. Um, so at any rate, this is, this is the extent when you're receiving, if you receive a DPPC report um, because you're the parent or guardian of um, someone who has been allegedly abused, if you receive it, and I'll tell you why, what the caveats are that, to that, then this is about what you're gonna get. You're gonna get a brief statement about what the allegation is, you're gonna get a finding and a conclusion, and those conclusions are going to be one or two of the following things. They could be the, the abuse or the allegation was substantiated, which means they found it to be um, something that probably did happen, or unsubstantiated, which means they found it to be, um, there, was, there was not enough evidence to prove that uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, so to speak, that, that this happened. Um, now I just threw in a legal, um, a legal you know, verbiage that we, we've all heard before and that's beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me be clear that the DPPC um, is not any part of the criminal, um, criminal system, okay? And we'll talk about that in a second. So um, I, I don't want to make, anyone believes that this is something that goes through the same, <clears throat> the same route as anybody going into the criminal justice system. This is outside of that, okay? So the findings and conclusions, again, for this particular situation where this abuser was found with drug paraphernalia is that um, it probably did happen, it was substantiated, and um, the conclusions or the the thing, what the action that took place was that this person was fired from his position. That's it. That's all that happened throughout this and whole investigation. Further, um, the the um, there's there's a little bit more to this report. The next page goes into a little bit more information. This is all just part of. This is the paperwork that comes through from DPPC. Um, it says exactly the same thing as. Um, as it did on the first page. And then I just wanted to point out by showing you a few other of the remaining pages, because there were four total, there's absolutely zero information about anything. Absolutely everything has been redacted with regard to who was involved, who did it, anything. Um, so, you know, these kinds of reports, when they come to you, you know, and this is, this is what happened with us. This was our first time seeing anything like this we didn't even know what we were looking at really. Um, and it gave us very little information and very little um, to go by, except to know that the person was had been fired. So that was the first report. That was the one that we were expecting. We knew this one was coming because the agency had called us and told us that they knew that this had happened and that they had actually reported themselves. The second envelope was one that we weren't expecting but it contained another report. So let me tell you a little bit before I show you that report, let me tell you what I found out later took place. 
there were, like I said, Nikki always has two people with him in the community. So there was the abuse, the alleged abuser, and one other person who happened to be a female. It was a male and a female. And when they were called in to be um, questioned about the drug paraphernalia investigation, okay, they were brought in separately. And the witness, the female witness, started talking privately to the DPPC investigator and just opened up about a whole lot more that was going on. And this was done in a different room. There were none of the agency representatives in there. It was just the investigator and this witness to this original complaint. Well, that opened up even more of a, a, a newer investigation that involved these things that had, were then reported under duress while this woman was being privately in, um, interviewed. And so we got a second letter without any, um, you know, any, any warning ahead of time. And what happened was they didn't, they didn't tell, the DBPC filed the report themselves. They did not tell the provider agency initially or quickly enough about this second investigation so the provider agency never told us about it because they had been left in the dark too. So all of this took place simultaneously. So now we get this second envelope in the mail on the same day as we had gotten this first envelope. And this one says something entirely different. It talks about a report was made and this one in particular, and you'll notice if you look back that the dates are the same, so this was the interview date. Um, there is an allegation that Nicholas Chan was verbally and physically abused by a caretaker. So I read this after reading the first one and went, wait, what is this all about? After further reading um, the investigation, when we get down to this page that talks about more specifics, um, the we find out that just about 10 days before this report was made, the alleged victim was having, Nikki was having a bad day and was banging his head against the window. The abuser pulled over into the next available parking lot. The abuser sat on Nikki with all of his weight and asked Nikki, what do you want and give me all you've got? The abuser took Nikki's hand and then began hitting himself in the face with his own hand. The abuser told Nikki, is this what you want, asshole, to hit me? Go ahead, hit me, asshole. This incident took approximately 10 minutes. The second incident occurred on uh, a few days later, about a week later, I guess. Um, Nikki was taken to the park. He became upset and he swung his fist at the abuser. Nikki was placed in a body control hold and began to swing his head back. The abuser then told Nikki, so you want a headbutt, you asshole? And he began headbutting Nikki repeatedly about four times. So, the second page of this report that we weren't expecting was a whole different story and really painted the picture of some horrible, horrible abuse, as you can see. Now, I'm going to share this last piece. This is the next page where it says, per the reporter, the abuser still has access to Nikki. Now that's because, again, everything all kind of happened at the same time the, the, during this investigation, um, the uh, witness told, chirped, right, um, about additional things, these other things that were happening to Nikki. Um, and so it just was this whole, there was at least a few days in there before the abuser was fired that he continued to work with Nikki. Um, and so it just was, the timing was just crazy right? Insane. It all happened at the same time. So um, therein lies the, the deepest part of the story. And it's not one of, like I said, this is the first time that I've shared any of this. Reading this, going back and reading this in preparation for this workshop was, was a rough moment for me. But this was the catalyst and this is what um, got me started on the journey. So before I tell you a little bit more about and go into the story of Nikki's law and how that happened. 
let me give you a little bit of insight about the DPPC itself. If you don't have a lot of experience, then that's good. That's because you haven't had to have a lot of experience. Um, but it's also important to really educate yourself about this process because it is, um, it's not that intuitive and it certainly doesn't feel like it's very, um, uh, like it's very well streamlined, let's put it that way. Although I have over the past many years come to understand the process and the system a little bit more, a little bit more than I did originally. Um, you know, there's there, I can tell you that the DPPC does their very best given what you're about to see in terms of the numbers of complaints and the numbers of investigations on a yearly basis that they have to deal with. But that said, it ends up being um, very frustrating on the part of the um, victims and their families when it comes to all of this investigative process. So to find out about the DPPC, you simply have to Google DPPC MA from Massachusetts and you're able to go straight to the mass.gov website on the left. Um, there's a screenshot of it and this is what you see. Now on the right over here, um, this is the actual chapter 19C, which is, which identifies and, um, and spells out all of the, um, all of the, how DPPC is going to operate. Okay. So there's a number of, um, investigative, um, arms of the DPPC. They have powers and duties, the referral of abuse reports, protective services, um, there talks about 19C covers everything. It covers their um, report, how to do hearings, how the whole thing operates, their, their requirements, their mandates, retaliation for reporting abuse, the scope of the chapter, so on and so forth. You can see it right there. But if you were to go and take a look at chapter 19C of the General Laws of Massachusetts, that is where you will find the Disabled Persons Protection Commission and how they operate. And I really, really suggest that you do that because um, again, if you are ever involved in the care uh, in any form, whether you're a parent or caregiver or um, you know, a case manager, an agency representative, it's really important that you understand um, at least the basics of how the DPPC operates so that when the time comes that you are involved in something, you do have a better understanding and you can kind of wade through what's important and what's not. I pulled this information from the DPPC's 2019 annual report. On the left, you'll see an, um, a letter from the executive director, um, Nancy Alterio, who um, was, was um, very, very supportive throughout the process of Nikki's law um, development, by the way. But in this report, you'll see that she, she says that, um, she reports that the DPPC received, this is in one year, 20,750 hotline calls, 13,102 abuse reports, which was a 10% increase from 2018, responded to 6,376 information and referral calls, recorded 1,272 death reports, assigned 3,153 3 investigations, completed 1,728 of those investigations, completed 123 petitions for review, and so on and so forth. So there are some extraordinary numbers in there that if you were to take a look at those in some of these other formats that I've shown here on other um, parts of the annual report, you'll see that um, a number of things. One, that there is a steady increase in abuse reports, which is good. I'm looking now on the right-hand side, there is a steady increase of abuse report reporting. And I say that's good because that may very well be a reflection of the DPPC and um, the partner organizations, DDS, um, um, the um, DMH, Department of Mental Health, and so on and so forth. Um, are probably doing a better job over the years of understanding the importance of these reports. Um, so there's that. There is also the dark side of this, which means that it's also likely that there is more abuse taking place. 
However, DPPC, regardless, they're taking a lot, a lot, a lot of calls. Now, with each, with each call and with each investigation that takes place, DPPC has to make some initial, um, some initial decisions about how to move forward. Very, a very small portion of all of the reports and of all of these calls end up getting to an end point that remains within the DPPC. So let me explain that. There are many times where those calls come in and they aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily fall under the general laws of those 19 C laws where the DPPC is allowed to operate. Some of them fall into cases where they need to be referred back to um, the presiding agencies like DDS and DMH. And those fall into categories that um, are likely to be, um, they don't necessarily um, can be defined as abusive. Um, they may be negligent, but they don't, they really belong back at that original um, presiding agency. So let me give you some examples of that. Um, one may be that, you know, a report came in that, um, that there were a staff shortage and the staffing wasn't appropriate for one shift at a particular um, DDS um, operated uh, environment. Or, um, you know, there was, there was something missing, personal items were missing, those kinds of things. And those, and you know, there's a whole bunch of other examples, but those are some of the examples of cases where DBBC is gonna say, you know what, this really doesn't constitute, um, you know, or require our level of investigation. I'm gonna refer that back to the presiding agency and, and ask them to follow up and look into what this um, report is alleging. And so that happens on a number of cases as well. But then for those that are, um, they do decide, determine fall under their jurisdiction, they will go ahead and open up an investigation. And that's where they will come out and they will do these interviews, work with the agencies and to figure out you know, what happened, make a determination about whether it's substantiated or unsubstantiated, and then make recommendations about how that agency should respond to what's going on. Now, I'll get into more of that in just a second. But what's important to know is that DPPC, and this is a long held belief that's, that's not true, DPPC does not do criminal investigations. They will, if they determine that criminal activity has taken place that could be considered criminal in a, in a court of law, then they will make a referral of that case over to the district attorney. So this is not something that they do internally. It is out of their jurisdiction. This is not how they operate. They will not conduct criminal investigations. They just conduct civil investigations that then will result in things like a person getting fired or, and or um, more trainings that are necessary by the, by the agency. Um, you know, and, and it, the list goes on and on about what the things might come out of from a substantiated case by the DPPC. So the DPPC decides whether or not it's going to stay in house or whether it's going to be referred back to the agency for, for resolution or if it's going to remain in house as part of the investigation, but also be referred to um, the district attorney's office for a criminal investigation. So that's how it operates. So there are these, this annual report also shows um, how many of the refer, if how many of the cases were referred to other agencies. And you can see that in the red um, graph, bar graph um, on the right hand side. So it says uh, um, in, the, in the text here, it says the graph on the right indicates that um, in fiscal year 2019, there were just under 10,000 reports that did not fall under DPPC jurisdiction and illustrates which state agencies they were referred to. So that's how th those numbers are crunched. Let me continue with regard to 
this uh, for, with regard to this annual report, what is also shown is that um, on the left-hand side here, this um, pie graph shows that during fiscal year 2019, the DPPC, DPPC hotline received 13,102 reports with 3,150 three of these reported sc reports screened in for investigation. In other words, they stayed in house because they felt that they would be able to um, investigate and find the substantiated abuse. You guys can continue to look at this when you receive this PowerPoint and look at these numbers. The bottom line that's really important for people to understand is that very, very, very few of these reports end up being screened in to the D by the DPPC for further investigation. If you look at the percentages, right? Very few of the total number of calls and reports end up truly being carried through as an investigation by the DPPC. Even fewer of those end up going to a criminal court. So already the chances that many of these calls that are made to DPPC are going to be thoroughly investigated is very, very low, okay? So this continues to be a problem within the DPPC and within the way that abuse investigations are taking place and reports are taking place. Right now, this is the only body in Massachusetts where that is, that is handling abuse cases outside of the systems taking care of things themselves, which is way too big a danger to continue to happen, right? So um, as you can see, these reports show a number of things. They show that there is a terrible burden on one organization to take all these calls, to do their investigation. They are understaffed um, and overworked. And this is one of the biggest problems that comes out of um, taking a look at these numbers and comes out of some of these experiences like my own. So not great information. Again, as I said earlier, educate yourself about the DPPC. Just a couple of things on the left and the right. This is not a thorough list. You can expect that you have the right to call and add information to a report has been, that has been made. So let me, let me explain that. When we received the call um, about from the day agency that they had reported and that the investigation and that they had made the report to DPPC. I called DPPC directly and I said, you know, what they told me was, well, you weren't there, so you don't really know what happened, but you can tell us a little bit more about Nikki. And so that was really um, important to me that I was able to share that Nikki was, you know, I was able to paint a picture of Nikki that made it clear that he was very, very vulnerable and would not be able to bear witness, report, or anything on his own. And that had some bearing on their investigation because the, it was, they were able to um, kind of weigh those factors that Nikki was completely, completely at the mercy of the abusers and not able to do any reporting of his own. So that, um, that was a key piece. Investigations typically take months to conclude. I'm gonna share a little bit about my experience with that. And the other thing you can expect is um, they will, like I said, if they have found criminal activity, um, you, they will refer it to the district's attorney's office and you can find out about how to be involved in any criminal proceeding from that office. So if it does go out there and Nikki's case did, we then went to and had um, parallel conversations with the district attorney's office about the criminal justice system investigation, which did not have anything to do with the DPPC thing. So we were talking to all sorts of people. What not to expect with regard to the DPPC, you cannot expect a report of findings unless you are the guardian and the finding was substantiated. In other words, DPPC is doing, has found their investigation to be substantiated or the abuse to be substantiated. You can request a copy of the report in the writing. I've included that um, link here. Um, and like I said, criminal charges, you cannot expect criminal charges by the DPPC. This is not their role. So again, I'll just go back to that one thing, what not to expect. You will not get a report of what happened, a report of this DPPC of, of don't expect that just because you made a call 
that there's going to be any sort of write, um, follow up in writing. Okay, that will not happen unless both of these things are true that you are the legal guardian, whether that's yourself of yourself or of the victim, and that the finding was substantiated by the DPPC. Those are those, both of those things have to be in place for you to receive a report. I get a lot of calls from people saying, I never got anything. Well, this, this is why one or one or both of those things was not um, the case. So my first action, um, now I'm going to go back to, um, and I know I, I'm watching my time here, so I'm going to have to go fast through the rest of this. My first action when um, all of this took place came out of a question that I asked while I was on that phone call with the DPPC trying to find out what more I could do or what I could expect. The question that I asked um, that was the catalyst for all of this was, you know, while this is all going on, what mechanism is in place to prevent this alleged abuser and the witness um, who had not reported, right, until she was under duress? What mechanism is in place to prevent both of those people from getting another position in another agency? And the answer was, nothing. There is no mechanism. Both of those people could go and get another job today at another agency. It will not show up on any reports. It does not show up on a quarry unless you're um, convicted of a crime in a criminal court, right? So even though these were both substantiated um, by DPPC, and even though one of them had been referred, that of the, the physical abuse one had been referred to the district attorney, both of these people could go and get another job anytime they wanted with another agency, possibly your agency. So this is still happening, by the way. It's going on on a regular basis. And this is why Nikki's Law has to happen. And it has. It'll be um, available starting next January. But anyway, we'll get to that. So I've shared in this PowerPoint the original letter that I sent. And um, you can read that on your own when you get the slides but I wanna make sure that I cover um, kind of a, a summary of the elements of that first letter, which are what I believe to be the most important elements of a letter. I get people calling me all the time, asking me, um, you know, how do, I, how do I get the attention of a legislator? Because something has happened and I really want some action to take place. So these are the elements of that first letter that I wrote. First, it went to the legislators of the towns where we live, where we live, my husband and I, in Auburn, where Nikki lives in Oxford, and where the day program responsible is located, which was in Millbury. We allowed the words of others, the professionals, to speak for themselves rather than inserting my own emotion. When you look back at this letter, you'll see that it's very, it's, it's, it's not free of emotion. I, I make mention that this was, you know, that our hearts are broken or whatever, but I don't go on and on gushing about that. Instead, I use the words of others to speak for themselves. So I've quoted parts of the DPPC reports regarding the abuses. I, I did retype those same words about exactly what happened, which are just horrific. And I described the conversation I had with the DPPC investigator and their response to my inquiry, which is exactly what I just told you about. What mechanism in place is in place? And the answer was none. So this is in that letter. Um, exactly as it's, you know, it, as it took place descriptively with very little emotion on my part. In addition, I wanted to make sure that when I contacted the legislators, I proposed a reasonable solution rather than saying, please do something. And I know from speaking with Senator Moore, Mike Moore, who um, took up this, this mantle and has continued um, with me through this whole journey, that was a key thing. I, rather than saying, something has to be done, this was awful, what are you gonna do? Um, I thought about it, I did a little bit of research, and I backed up my proposal, which was to create an abuse registry with some precedents and provided those links. So before I wrote the, before I sent out this letter, I did some research and I said, you know, there needs to be something in place, an abuse registry, huh, I wonder if that's a novel idea. And in doing their, my research, it didn't take me more than a week or so to find and interview um, representatives from other states who do have abuse registries in place. 
So I was able to add in my letter that I think it was, um, I think it was Tennessee and Connecticut and um, yep, New Jersey and Ohio. And there were more, a number of states, also the state of California had abuse registries in place. So I was able to say in this first contact letter, we don't need to invent the wheel, which I'm sure um, was helpful in terms of, you know, getting, getting people on board, getting these legislators on board. Um, and I asked for their action and offered to help. The action was, please, um, I'll go back to the letter and read it. The action was, consider our request on, be on behalf of our most vulnerable citizens. Lend your support and resources to drafting legislation that will create an offender's registry that can be shared among human service providers and service agencies so that abusers like those my son endured can be reduced substantially. So again, all of the elements um, listed here were in that initial letter. And it was not, it, you know, the first letter that I tried to draft right after I saw all those reports was an entirely different letter. Um, it contained everything from emotion and profanity to, you know, threats and all of those things that every single one of us I know listening to this right now would know would be their first response, right? Um, that was not going to be helpful. That was not going to be, um, you know, cathartic maybe in the moment, but ultimately it would just build walls and make me out to be just a screaming maniacal mom who had reason to be screaming and maniacal, but you know, wasn't offering up anything that would be helpful. So it was really important that, that I draft a letter that would um, speak to all these things, touch upon the travesty, but also offer up a solution and offer myself as, as someone who was willing to continue the conversation. So that was an important piece. So the first lesson that I started to learn over the course of the six years that it took to make this happen was that stuff takes time. It shouldn't, but it does. And when you do go back and read these slides, because I know you're all gonna, um, you'll see that I have provided a bit of um, a timeline from the time that um, that these first that we first got notified of this and the time that I started that I sent out that first letter right in June right through July August August September September right up until September 29th um, I had been going back and forth through emails and phone calls and documenting all of these things and you know, if you'll notice, it was in the middle of the summer, so all sorts of people were taking vacations. People weren't returning calls. They were working part time. It was the most frustrating part of this whole process. Um, but the truth is, this is the way it typically is going to be. There are so many different people involved in this, and so many, you know, different ideas of of whether or not it did happen and so many opinions and so on and so forth that you just have to really stay on top of this. Um, it, and it wasn't until the end of September, on September 29th, that I finally was able to get a solid answer from somebody. And I found out that the very next day that the abuser was being arraigned um, in criminal court, 105 days after that first incident was reported. So that was a very, very frustrating summer. And this is the kind of thing that you can expect if you become involved in a DPPC investigation and or a criminal investigation. So lesson number one, this stuff takes time. Um, I want to get into, for those of you who have, you know, um, said things to me like, well, you know, I would have just called the media first. Well, the media can be your friend and it can be your enemy. So another lesson that I learned um, was when to use it and when not to. So again, three months later on Monday, September 29th, or yeah, September 29th, 2014, I sent this letter out to a whole lot of the people who had been skirting around and not answering me. Um, and the statement was, be, please be informed that we, Cheryl and Alex Chan, are prepared to issue a statement to the media and an open letter to the autism and disability community that reflects poorly on the lack of attention to the case in the subject line. 
in which on two instances, our son was physically abused by a staff person at his day program. We have demonstrated extraordinary patience. So it was at this point that I invoked um, the whole media thing, not before. I don't think that that was a, I didn't think that that was going to be a good idea. And I talk about why in just a minute, but three months after all of this had already happened and think about it in my mind, these, these, these two people who were involved in this, the abuser and the witness were no longer able to be anywhere near Nikki. As far as I knew, they weren't employed by the agency anymore, but they were floating out there. Who knows where? probably at another job at another agency. So all of this ticking is going by in our minds and it felt very much like we were being ignored. So we invoked the media. Now, we didn't have to because that very same afternoon, just a short while later, the DA's office had called. So as I said in a little, I probably shouldn't have included this, but I, in, an, in an email to a friend of mine, I said, huh, the DA's office just called, imagine that. I didn't answer, they can wait. That, that probably wasn't the right thing for me to do, but I did it anyway, and I did call them back later on. But at any rate, this is the kind of thing that had to be done to get people understanding what was the importance of this and the seriousness. Prior to that, people just weren't listening. It was really incredible. So. One of the lessons that I learned regarding using the media is to think very carefully before you contact the media. The story should be more than a tragedy or more than just the tragedy. Otherwise, it becomes just another sad story. There should be something valuable to the reporter that they can investigate. So again, I hadn't, you know, a lot of people say, well, you should have just called the media or they give that advice to other people who say, you know, my, my person, the person that I love has been abused. Well, call the media. Well, that's going to end in a very quick report that everybody goes, oh, that's awful, as opposed to waiting until there is, there is news to share. And that news in our case was, you know what, we have launched an, um, a, a request to our legislators. They're drafting a bill, and this is what the bill is going to do. So it wasn't until then that we talked, we went straight, we decided that invoking the media was a good idea. Be prepared to make the contact you warn about if you are not satisfied. So in other words, what I'm talking about there is I made the threat that I would go to the media if I didn't get a call. I got the call, so I didn't go to the media. But if I hadn't gotten the call, I was going to go and um, make that, make a pretty big stink about it. But I also, that was also very calculated and I did not want to do that. Because, as I say in the third bullet point here, you will make an enemy out of anyone you name or call out as being part of the problem. The media will go to them for a response. You will burn that bridge and think about how much you may need them in the future. This goes back to the very original, the, one of the very first slides that I showed you in our conversation that my husband and I had about what, how often or whether or not we were going to name the agency the, or the perpetrators and making the decision that we were not going to do that. That was in part for all the reasons I gave before, but also because now it becomes um, burned bridges. And we needed the agency at the time to not have walls built up so that um, because there was a criminal trial, they were all gonna be called in as witnesses to that. And also, you know, as soon as we invoke them, now it just simply becomes, you know, the Chans hate X agency and X agency is going to come to their own defense and it's going to be whittled down into that kind of problem instead of something much broader and much wider that affects global change. So using the media is a very powerful tool, but it's also something that I tell people it needs to be done very responsibly. Because when you become the face of the story, and this is what happened with us, you know, um, we quickly um, were called upon to be that face, to be the spokesperson for Nikki's Law. And we had to be, we were called frequently by the press. Um, these are some of the tips that I give to people. Practice a 20 to 30 second statement until you can say it firmly and authoritatively. So if you ever were caught any of the news um, stories around Nikki's Law over the course of the past several years, whenever they, they had a clip of me, 
I was literally saying the exact same thing over and over again because I had that one that one statement that I made and just had and just kept playing over and over. Um, don't be afraid to show emotion, but maintain control. Really, really important. Um, stand your ground regarding personal information or decisions. Um, we got a lot of pressure from the media. Come on, you know, it's really important. This is, it'll make a great story. It's important that, you know, you make, you name them. I mean, we were guilted, shamed and all of that by the media. They just wanted the story. We held our, our ground and did not name anybody. Um, be prepared to be invited by advocacy organizations to speak. I did the whole rounds of all the conferences and all of the advocacy days at the state house and all of that. So um, when you become, when you decide to become the face of something like this, these are the things that are going to happen and you need to be ready to, um, to say yes to these invitations. Um, participating in legislative advocacy hearings, um, and, you know, private conversations with the legislators over and over and over again while these things are going on. You also need to allow the experts to guide you. So the experts in our case really came on board very quickly. Senator Moore was the one who responded first to our initial um, letter, and he immediately brought in the Ark of Massachusetts. So everybody is a well aware of the Ark of Massachusetts. They are a fantastic organization. They are absolutely not just a leader, they are the leader in terms of legislative advocacy, lobbying, creating bills, partnering with legislators and so on and so forth. They have, they have it down, they're the expert. So this partnership was the key to the passage of Nikki's Law. If I had taken this upon myself and not partnered with anybody, and um, just try to do this, you know, as a mom, I would not have been able to get anywhere near um, the passage of Nikki's law as quickly as it did. The ARC um, has access to legislators, recognition as a voice of the disability community, and experience in working with the state house, although of those things were critical to success. Other partners that came on board over time were Dana's family. Um, there was a, um, Dana's family are Paul and Ann Joyce, and the Joyce's had been working with Senator Davis at the same time, um, just a few years after we had started all of the process of Nikki's Law. And they weren't familiar with us and we weren't familiar with them until we found each other's bills and preparing for, a, for an early hearing. And so very quickly, we put our heads together and said, we, we can't have two separate bills. We need to make sure that we bring everybody together. And so we did, and we came an even bigger force for change. So partnerships are really, really key, really, really important to all of this. And most, the most important partnership is the voices of the community. Over the years, um, you know, like I said, I've been doing all sorts of hearings and public speaking engagements and so on and so forth. But social media was our, our partner and our friend throughout all of this and bringing people together and encouraging them and making sure that they were a part of the conversation and acknowledging the community, asking them to be a part of it, um, empowering them, making sure all of that happened. That was just as important as important part of the partnership that led to this as anything else. And so another lesson that I often give to people is that you're only as strong as the community that you belong to. So again, as soon as we put our faces out in the public, um, we received hundreds of emails over the next several years and we continue to, my husband and I, from families whose loved ones had also been traumatized by abuse. And that was very helpful to us personally. And it was very helpful to the cause of Nikki's Law because we realized and the legislators realized and the public realized that this is not just one person's story. This is not just a sad little thing that happened to some kid. This is a chronic problem. People turn to us to be the voice for them. This is a huge responsibility. Um, I've already talked about what it takes, what you need to be aware of if you're going to become the face of anything like this. And it was something that we undertook um, with you know, a lot of thinking. We didn't immediately say yes. We had to think because we knew this was going to be big. Um, we collaborated with all of um, the ARC, AFAM legislators, et cetera, the experts. And we pressed the messages and dialogues that they were sharing without creating our own that might disagree or seem like we weren't on the same page. Because believe me, through all of this, if you're involved in something like this personally, 
what you want to do is is just just go and find these people and beat them up you know you want to you want to swear you want to scream you want to pull your hair out you want to you want to talk about you know the travesty of the whole thing so it's really important that you allow um, your community to be a part of this so that you then become one voice of many and everybody's messages becomes just as just as important and part of the dialogue um, that's again how it becomes a bigger picture item facebook became the leading tool we used to disseminate calls to action and provide updates we also used Facebook to give praise and gratitude to the community, acknowledging individuals and their stories as often as possible with permissions, of course. And we made sure that um, we ignored the negativity. Um, we needed to rise above. We, you know, as soon as you get ingra ingrained in some sort of nitpicky argument, um, you know, you lose your credibility. So you need to be able to rise above and not swear the way. I would like to. <laughs> we had a day of triumph after six years. Now, if you had been um, following the story at all, then you know that it took two um, years of being in legislative session. The first year it was, um, it did not pass. And that's a story that I don't have time for today, but um, suffice it to say, it did not pass. But we, we rallied again and, um, Put the bill in for a second year and that's when it passed so i'd like to show you um, a video clip of the day that it did pass and one of the many many news stories that um covered it maria the latest report from the disabled person protection commission says abuse is up by 10 percent against those with intellectual and developmental disabilities and after what happened here a unanimous vote a safety net is going in place there were cheers with this afternoon's passage in the House of Representatives of Nikki's Law. It's named for an Auburn family's 27-year-old autistic disabled son. Nikki had been severely beaten on at least a couple of occasions. The unanimous vote, 154 to 0, for Nikki's Law creates a registry of abusive caregivers so they can't move from job to job. Finally, you know, the Commonwealth has some common sense. It's a great bill, and uh, it's going to change lives. The Joyce family elated. Their nonverbal son, Dana, was abused four years ago. We put a camera in his room and, and discovered the abuse. We were terrified of what we would find. Senator Michael Moore helped the bill pass the Senate twice. It's been six years to get to today to close a loophole that hurts the most vulnerable and yet allows caregivers due process. We worked with the ARC. We worked with the public counselors. We worked with the SEIU, who many of these individuals belong to, to make sure that their rights are protected. We need them. And most of them obviously do God's work on this earth. So we need to make sure that that was ironclad, that it stood up in a court of law. Now, right now, the Department of Developmental Services, which hires and contracts home giver, uh, caregivers, they'll have access to that registry. But down the road, it could be available to all state agencies and eventually maybe even families looking for homemakers. Live at the State House, Ron Della Richardson, WCBB. So again, that was one of many reports that came out that, that extraordinary day here in 2020. And on the left, you'll see pictures of the day that the governor signed the bill, which was March 3rd of 2020, um, a couple weeks after um, the, the vote that took place where you saw that. So it, it was voted in unanimously. And um, you know, that was, that was fantastic. So DDS provides support to over 40,000 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in a variety of residential settings, community-based day programs, and employment settings. Because of Nikki's law, effective January 31st, 2021, any individual listed on the registry cannot be hired or work for DDS or any of its licensed or funders pro funded providers throughout the state. So yeah, you know, job well done. So if, you know, I think there are a lot of lessons and I think that I could do this workshop for three, four, five hours discussing all of the things that came out of this. Um, I was asked to do, to talk about Nikki's law 
for the AFC Summit. And I'm really glad that I've been able to share more about the intricacies and the history and, and how this all came about. Um, you know, it, I've, I joked when, uh, when it passed that day and we were at the State House and just celebrating all together, hundreds of us. And um, I said, you know, they said, well, you know, what, what are some of the things that you've learned? And I said, my biggest takeaway is that I'm never going to run for office. I don't ever want to be a part of this process. This process is frustrating. This process is um, frustrating at best. It's difficult. It's, it's um, clunky. It is, and by this, I mean the bill passage process. It, um, it takes too long. And in the meantime, while all those six years were, we were passing, um, over and over again, people were still being abused. And they're still being abused today. And we see these kinds of articles happening from all over the country, indeed all over the world, all of the time. Until people with disabilities are actually valued as human beings and seen as people who can, citizens who contribute to their communities, we're going to see this happening over and over again. In the meantime, I get a lot of questions about how's Nikki doing. Nikki's doing great. It's been six years, and he's got this whole group of staff at his New Day program who absolutely love him, and he loves them. And this is the kind of thing that you get when, uh, when you just give Nikki a little bit of love, a little bit of dignity. Um, he'll love you right back. And as all of you know, there are far more stories and cases that look like this than there are that look like anything else. So I hope that I have given you all um, some insight into a few things, a little bit of education, a little bit of background, a little bit of something to think about. And certainly I hope that you um, feel the importance of staying involved in legislative advocacy, in playing your role in being a mandated reporter. Don't ever, ever not call or make a judgment about whether or not something is important or did or didn't happen. Let the experts do that. Um, and certainly be, um, you know, I hope that all of you who work in this understand that all of us who are consumers um, couldn't appreciate all the work that you do anymore. Um, you are truly heroes. You do this every day. You do it for many, many people. I know a lot of you have case loads like this. I could never do what you do. So thank you for all that you do. Um, and with that, I'll just hand it back. I'm seeing a little bit of stuff coming through. I don't know if um, Carrie or Deb, you want to um, point out any questions or anything. Yeah, Cheryl, there's um, no questions that I see, but um, certainly some, some comments um, that that was a great video and um, gave me chills. Um, I wrote this, your perseverance is inspiring. There's some um, thank yous, again, very inspiring. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, very inspiring and touching. Um, thank you, Cheryl. What you pulled together this morning was powerful and impressive. Um, thank you for sharing your, lots of thank you for sharing your story. Um, what an amazing story. Thank you for fighting to keep the most vulnerable people safe. Um, thank you for fighting the good fight. Yeah, well, thank you all again. I can't believe I did it in my, within the time limits. <laughs> I always talk way too much, but um, thank you all for listening and for joining. And um, the PowerPoint will be made available. I'm on Facebook um, with a lot of friends. So um, join me anytime, Cheryl Ryan Chan. Um, anybody who wants to reach out to me can also find me at Cheryl Ryan Chan at Gmail. So I'm always open and um, interested in hearing other stories or other ways that Nikki's Law might have impacted um, what you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Cheryl. We'll keep the chat open for another couple of minutes in case some questions come through. Um, but we certainly would like to thank you for closing out this week along series with such an important presentation. It was, it was wonderful. Um, to all of our participants this week for the AFC sub webinar series, we thank you uh, for joining us. Please follow us on the AFC Summit's Facebook page and website for future webinar announcements. 
Uh, we hope you all enjoy your weekend. Um, as part of the email this afternoon containing evaluation and the PowerPoint, we'll certainly also provide Cheryl's contact information uh, in the event that you'd like to reach out to her. But thank you all so much. Have a great day. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl, I don't know if you're reading the chats, but um, there was, I did not know uh, who the story was behind the law, and I'm so amazed by you. Oh, yeah. Who is Carolyn Griffin? Do you know? Carol, I, I do. I supervise her. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, thank you. Amazing. You made a difference, and out of something negative, at least others will be more protected as a result of this. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you. Very, very valuable information. This is, this is what buoys, buoys me to keep fighting, hearing that this is valuable. <clears throat> I so appreciate all of you for listening. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Yeah. I have my tissues ready. Did you? I have my tissues ready too. I'm pretty <laughs> proud of myself and a whole box. I didn't use any of them, yeah. I, I, I came close, but you know, like I said earlier, I've, I've been talking about this for such a long time that, you know, it just, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. I guess you just get used to it. And, and you, you kind of have to remember that um, you got to keep it held together so that, you know, um, you can get that message through because, you know, you start choking up and, and you, lose, you lose the moment, I guess. I don't know. It's tough. Not easy, but. You're incredibly brave. It was it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So people are still on, probably trying to figure out how to leave. <laughs> That's okay. I think we can uh, we can close it out. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for for joining us. Um, All right. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you, so you much. Cheryl. Yep. Bye, ladies. Bye, everybody. Take care. You too.